going to start with basketball. Yesterday, we revealed the women's conference schedule. Today, our big story reveals the men's conference schedule. We dive into a few of the headlines here. As has been the case in recent years, everyone in the conference plays at least once in early December with 12 teams playing two games. Tipping off December 2nd, Kevin Willard, his conference debut at Maryland against Illinois. The last day of the regular season could be wild. Six games on that Sunday, including Michigan, Indiana, and Illinois, Purdue. The schedule also includes three conference games on New Year's Day. Let's get to our big interview. It is Kerry Kenny, senior vice president of the Big Ten, one of the guys who fit this massive puzzle together. And Kerry, appreciate you joining us. I know you're in Minneapolis today as we prepare for the women's tourney in Minneapolis. Focusing on the men, though, today, give us a sense of the biggest priorities as you start. And we were talking with, with Megan Kahn about this yesterday, too. You start with this blank page and you have to come up with the schedule that you revealed today. Well, thanks, Dave. It's great to be with you today. And, and yes, it is as complex a puzzle as we deal with on the scheduling side at the Big Ten and uh, would argue that it's the most complicated schedule we put together in all of college sports. Uh, when you think about four major broadcast partners in BTN, CBS, Fox, and ESPN, 14 facilities that uh, share with other non-basketball entities like Olympic sports or concerts or high school state championships, um, and then just uh, the, the men's and the women's games all fitting into the same puzzle together. You have 140 men's games, 126 women's games, and so 266 games in a three-month stretch, there's just a lot of different things that as we put this together, you need to prioritize certain things in parallel paths, certain things get a little bit more preference when it comes to uh, certain television windows that we need to hit. Um, you know, for example, CBS uh, primarily broadcasts games on weekends, um, whereas BTN can televise games on seven nights of the week. And so when you think about all the different dates and venue conflicts and everything uh, that we have to solve for it really is a puzzle that there, there's not one perfect solution uh, but you try and put all of those things together and arrive at a schedule that really balances out across all 14 schools and as you look at each one individually one may look a little bit tougher than the other for a certain stretch but overall we're really just uh, really trying to strike that balance from early december through early march where Nobody is really overly advantaged or overly disadvantaged based on the 20 games on the men's side that they have to play each year. You mentioned 20 games. I do want to dive a little bit into that. It's been a few years now since the Big Ten went to a 20-game conference schedule. And in basketball, as we know, there is a massive reward in terms of getting into the postseason for your strength of schedule. And so it certainly makes sense if you're in a really good league to play one another more there is, of course, the flip side of it where you're beating one another up quite a bit because you're playing so many good teams. What is kind of that balancing act in terms of staying at 20? And, and to what degree do you believe this has impacted the Big Ten? Dave, it's, it's really a, a multi-year process that we engaged in with uh, our conference staff, uh, our head coaches, athletic directors, and other people on campus, our network partners. And and to your point, when you have a conference that, you know, when we went through this exercise, we were 14 members, we're still there this year. Uh, and for one year after, we really looked at, you know, the metrics of how teams access the postseason. At the end of the day, that's what all of our programs are striving to do. They're striving to hear their name called in, in the bracket reveal show on that final Sunday of, of championship week. And so as we looked at the metrics, we, we looked at how our non-conference schedules were built, how our conference schedules worked at the time with an 18-game schedule. And really, it was the buy-in from the coaches that, that said, look, we understand that this may result in, in some tougher schedules. It may result in, you know, you remove two non-conference games that you otherwise would likely win, and you add two conference games where uh, at best you go 2-0, and but you could also go 0-2 in those games. And so we looked at it across the entire slate of, of how it would impact our schools and, and where we arrived. We were coming off of a year uh, where, if you remember, we only had four teams access the NCAA uh, tournament that year. Nebraska, who had a really great season, uh, was left out of the tournament. And so it, it really was a compelling time for us to consider going to 20 games. And, and since we did that in the 2018-19 season, we've seen a stretch of 26 uh, NCAA tournament bids and it would have been 36, but for the COVID year that was canceled, uh, if you look at the projections. 
And so to have that three year stretch, we, we understand obviously that it doesn't just mean something to get into the tournament. You have to win when you get there. And, and our coaches obviously are, are working each day to, to get to that point where we can see more teams advance throughout the tournament. But really, it's, it's an opportunity to, you know, kind of celebrate the progress that our, our conference has made on the men's basketball side. To say 26 teams over three years, that just provides great lifelong experiences for those student athletes. And, and obviously, our coaches are really good at developing players and, and developing, um, you know, kind of people that come in as maybe some less heralded recruits. And by the time they leave their first round draft picks, um, and you look at that with, uh, you know, a Johnny Davis last yeah. year or Keegan Murray at Iowa. And so we're, we're really excited about you know, kind of leaning into that for another year here, the, the Gavit games, the ACC challenge have also been, you know, really big components in, in getting that scheduling metric up to where those NCAA bids have, have been a little bit more plentiful these last few years. As you mentioned, nine teams in last year that tied the all time record set way back the previous year for the Big Ten. So it has been uh, it's been really good. No doubt about it. You mentioned you're in Minneapolis. We got media days coming up about a month or so from now in Minneapolis for the first time. I know that's something I'm looking forward to, and I, I know the, the student athletes are as well. What else can we look forward to in this Big Ten men's hoop season? Yeah, Dave, just a, a lot of excitement. Um, you know, obviously mentioned a few names uh, in the previous question, but we, we had nine draft picks last year, uh, three in the first round. And so the, the depth and quality of talent, uh, both from a team perspective and individual perspective, I think you're going to see that again this year. Um, we, we've had a, a coaches that have had a lot of success on the recruiting trail uh, in the transfer portal uh, with, with that being so predominant now in, in our ecosystem. And so we're, we're really excited to see some of the new faces, but really a lot of the veterans that that have come back and and will continue to elevate our programs uh, as we go into to November through the, the early part of March. You know, our, our coaching continuity is a huge thing uh, in the Big Ten, um, obviously having familiar faces there and, uh, you know, some with a lot of experience in the conference, some new fresh perspectives in the conference will will really help balance out as we look to, you know, whether it's a, a different uh, rules, uh, things on the on the NCAA playing rules side of things or, or big picture items like activating our new television deals. Uh, in a year's time. I, I think that's going to be a really important group to lean into. Um, but there's also just this really, you know, kind of, uh, I mentioned coming off the NCAA tournament success, a lot of positive momentum that we think that this is going to be the year where we're going to have a couple of teams make some really deep runs into the NCAA tournament. I think as you look at our, our one through 14, you know, kind of what those standings project to be, there's going to be no easy nights in the Big Ten. And I think that's been a hallmark of our conference for the last few years and and you challenge yourself you season yourself throughout the regular season um, uh, on all nights of the week on on four really great network partners and you position yourself to hopefully have that postseason success if the conditions are right to do that uh come march and april so just a lot of excitement uh the tournament at the united center this year so really excited to have all those big 10 alumni in the chicago area that'll be able to to show up and cheer for their teams in that five-day event uh, in, in the middle of March. So just a lot of excitement and momentum here on the Big Ten men's basketball side of things, Dave. Excitement on our end as well, Kerry. Can't wait to see how it all unfolds. Kerry Kenny, thanks for taking some time on a very busy day. Much appreciated. Thanks, Dave. Checking out a few of the biggest games in addition to Illinois, Maryland on opening weekend that we touched down. You can see Wisconsin and Iowa. Interested to see how they look without some of the players Kerry mentioned. Johnny Davis, Keegan Murray. Hunter Dickinson in Michigan, first two games against the Spartans in their outstanding backcourt. They will play them actually a couple of times this year, as they do every year, but they'll play in early January. Early February features Purdue and matchup nightmare Zach Eady against Trace Jackson Davis and the Hoosiers. They will score off twice in three weeks. Last day of the regular season, Illinois, very talented, overhauled roster in West Lafayette. Plus, you get the Wolverines and the Hoosiers. As promised, Robbie Hummel is here. Robbie, so many comings and goings. And look, that is just the nature of college basketball, college sports, frankly, in this day and age. The less roster continuity than we are accustomed to. So before we get into the nuts and bolts of some of the schedule, just 
give people an overview. Like, who, who do you think some of the best teams in the league will be this year? Well, I think when you're talking about the best, best teams in the Big Ten this year, we're going to have to start with the Indiana Hoosiers. And it's because of what you just said, where there's just a lack of turnover. Outside of Parker Stewart and outside of Rob Finnessy, you got everybody back. And most importantly, you bring back Trace Jackson Davis, your point guard and Xavier Johnson is back. Race Thompson is an elite role player in this league. So I think Mike Woodson has done a really nice job. On top of all those things, you throw in one of the better recruiting classes in the Big Ten. And I think Indiana is positioned really well with their roster. The question on them is always going to be, can they make enough jump shots? Yeah, Which right. is, I know it drives their fans right. crazy because the state of Indiana prides itself on making shots. And you mentioned losing Parker Stewart, who was their arguably shooter. their best shooter yeah. last year. Okay, so you start with the Hoosiers because there are fewer unknowns. Where do you go from there? Well, now you go to, to maybe the ultimate unknown. Yes. And that's the, the, the Illinois fighting Illini. And I just say that because you have no Kofi Coburn, you have no Trent Frazier, no DeMonte Williams, no Jacob Grandison, no Alfonso Plummer. Losses like that for most teams are going to be too much to overcome. But give Brad Underwood a ton of credit. Him and his staff have really overcome all those departures with the transfer portal and, and with a high-level recruiting class. And with those transfers, you look at Matt Meyer, you look at Terrence Shannon Jr., long, athletic, uber-talented guys that come from the Big 12. I think both those guys are going to have really good seasons, and I think Illinois is going to look totally different this year. Last year, so much of it was just pounded into Kofi Coburn. Yeah. I'm not saying we're going to go back to seeing the, the crazy amounts of pressure we saw from Underwood early, but I do think that Illinois is going to try to get out in the open court with those athletes, pressure you. I wouldn't be surprised if they press. They're, they're going to look so much different this year in the Big Ten. Lots of excitement about Sky Clark. You mentioned Terrence yes, Shannon. Totally. It could be a, a really good backcourt. So those are your top two. Where do you go from there? Well, I, now it starts to get a little murkier, I think. And I'm going to go with the Michigan State Spartans, I think, just because they also, when you look at their roster, they, they do bring a lot of guys back. A.J. Hogarth and Tyson Walker are going to lock down that spot at the point guard position. Malik Hall is back for another year, as is Joey Hauser. So when you look at those four guys, sparks of brilliance, but consistency is going to be yeah. the biggest question. It's been a roller coaster for those those guys, Tom Izzo is always bringing in some good freshmen as well. But if they can get that group of four, that core nucleus, to play a little bit more consistently, Michigan State can, can be one of the top teams in the league and maybe even exceed that third spot. I continue to wonder about the center position with them. Is Joey Hauser the answer there? Totally. Or, you know, it doesn't Small really ball. seem like Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we saw your last two there. They actually showed the graphic. Purdue and Ohio State. Give us a quick thumbnail on those two. Well, I think Purdue, you're going to start with Zach Heaty. They are going to throw the ball into him. Anytime he wants it, they're going to post him, and I think he's going to have a monster season. For the Boilermakers, the question is the guard play. Is David Jenkins from Utah the answer? Can Brandon Newman get back to the level that we saw two years ago? The guard position is going to be the big question marks for Purdue. For Ohio State, much like Illinois, you've got to mold it and got to bring it together. I like Sean McNeil, the transfer out of West Virginia. Last two seasons, he's averaged 12 a game. Shot about 37% from three. I love Isaac Likely. He's one of those guys, 1,000 points, 600 rebounds, 400 assists in his three years at Oklahoma State. Both those guys come in. The best recruiting class in the Big Ten comes into Columbus, Ohio. And because of that, I think Chris Holman, who's recruited at a high, high level in both of those facets, he can have Ohio State playing in that top five. Yeah, fascinated to see that group. And then, of course, you've got Iowa. You don't want to rule them out. No. I think Rutgers can make a strong case for yep. being a tournament team again. And Wisconsin. Mich Michigan, too. Michigan, yeah. Wisconsin's plenty, made it 22 in the last 23 can, years. Absolutely. Plenty <laughs> of groups that can make that jump yeah, into so the top five. They'll probably figure out a way to be in the conversation. Let's run through some top games. Uh, you mentioned right off the top, you know, Indiana is, is your best team. They go to Rutgers, which yeah. may have your best home court, or certainly one well, of your well, better well, home court advantages in week one. That is a great opening weekend. Welcome right? to the Big Ten season, right? <laughs> yeah. And Indiana, we'll get into their schedule. It is brutal. And you start at the rack. We saw Purdue go in there as a highly ranked team last year and come out with a loss. That's a heck of a way to start. I think that to be the first game that we have to kick off Big Ten play, we're going to find out a lot about Indiana immediately. Yeah, beat number one Purdue there last year. Only lost three home games a season ago. It's become a great home court. Iowa and Wisconsin is an interesting one just because you mentioned these are teams that are perennially going to be in the hunt. Yeah. But, man, they lost some star power. And so, to me, I'm fascinated to see how they match up against one another there in early December. Well, and a lot of similarities. You know, two teams that had championship caliber seasons last year in this league and two teams that also lose a lottery pick. You, you, know, you lose right. Keegan Murray, you lose Johnny Davis. Both teams also have a twin brother of that lottery pick <laughs> right. that maybe can be the guy that elevates his game. 
Chris Murray is the guy that is more ready to do that. I think Jordan Davis, there's more question marks around him. But, you know, that's going to be a show-me game. That's one of those games early in the season where if, if you want to make a statement and say that you can be a team that moves into that upper echelon, it's a game you got to win. Two teams that I think can really have strong seasons, but we – we just have a lot of unknowns, and I'd say more unknowns about Wisconsin than there are about Iowa. And a year ago, we would not have sat here and said those two guys were going to be lottery picks. No. And that is the beauty not of at it. All. The, the unknown is the beauty of it. A Michigan to Michigan State is such a great rivalry. You talked about the Spartans being in your top five and Michigan kind of being on the cusp. They have, yes. a, outside of Hunter Dickinson, a ton of unknowns Yeah, there absolutely. As well. And Hunter Dickinson is going to be a guy that is one of the best players, not just in this league, but in the entire country, is going to be out with something to prove. And I think when you're talking about making a statement, going on the road to your rival in East Lansing and, and winning a game like that, that can be Michigan's opportunity to, to make that statement. The, the guard position is going to be extremely – unknown. I, I think there's some talent coming into Michigan and certainly some guys that are left over. Kobe Buck and a guy that I think could make that jump for them. But um, it's going to be, you know, it's, it's always a grind. It always yeah. is a grind regardless of whether you got everybody coming back, nobody coming back. But I think that Michigan certainly has as many unknowns as you, we talked about earlier with Illinois and also Ohio State. It's interesting. We dissect these schedules. I was looking at Michigan State. I mean, they have a stretch of like nine straight games where you could argue all those teams are either NCAA tournament teams or teams that, that are kind of on the cusp. I mean, in that group that we've mentioned of eight or nine that, that could potentially play there. Uh, Indiana and Illinois. So these were your two top teams going head-to-head -head January 19th. Give us a sense of, of what you anticipate in that matchup. Yeah, that's just that's the first heavyweight battle that I would say we're going to yeah. see in, in conference play. And both Illinois and Indiana, we've talked about them already. Super talented uh, with Illinois. Can they mold this group fast enough? Indiana, I think it's can they make jump shots? But that's one that I think everyone will have circled on the calendar. And when you talk about the, both those venues, this one in Champaign, it doesn't get much better than that when you have two of the best teams in the conference playing in January. Uh, great rivalry historically. Illinois, it's interesting. They play Ohio State, Indiana, Wisconsin twice, but that's it. I mean, in terms of the, the two plays, it feels Their like. Their schedule it, is favorable. Yeah. I it, think it, that's fair to it, say. It feels like it's, it sets up pretty well for them. And then we were talking about those games at the end. Illinois finishing at Purdue. You want to talk about tough yeah, venues and I, I just, they'll play in. Absolutely. But I think that the, the beauty of conference play is that if it comes down to the end, we've got the best teams playing against each other. And Purdue's yes. going to be right there. Illinois will be there. We know Mac Urine will be rocking. This is a great game to kind of finish that conference slate. Okay. So those are your, your top matchups. Again, I think Kerry makes a great point. They do everything they can to make it as equitable as they can. You really can't anticipate how all this is going to play out. That being said, is there one team whose conference <laughs> schedule really stands out to you? With all yes. the caveats. Yes, there is. Yes. It's the Indiana Hoosiers. You know, for the most talented group, or maybe not the most talented group, but the most cohesive group, you're going to have the toughest schedule, and it's by no reason or fault of its own. But when you look at their double plays, Rutgers, Purdue, Iowa, Northwestern, Michigan State, Michigan, Illinois, that is mostly some of the best teams in the league. So they, they certainly got maybe – the tougher draw, but you know if you're going to win this league, you got to win games, and regardless of who you're playing, you, you just got to go out there and, and handle business. Yeah, I would argue as I look through their schedule, probably eight of their last nine games are against likely NCAA they're, they're, teams. Their finisher is brutal. Yeah, no, <laughs> it really is. Whereas, like the flip side, Rutgers, you look at them. I mean, if they're in a really good position, here's Indiana's last seven games. You see, I mean, Northwestern probably doesn't project to be a an NCAA team unless they take a jump, but but the rest of those do. You know, Rutgers is the flip side. I mean, I, if, if they're in a good position down the stretch, they probably have four of six against non-NCAA tournament teams. Yeah, right? and I, I think looking at that, that last seven games graphic right there, you mentioned Northwestern. They did lose in Evanston last year. You know, it can yes. be a place that can trip you up regardless of what the team looks like. But when you're talking about playing Illinois, you got Michigan twice in there. You've got Purdue. you got four or five on the road. I mean, that, that is a brutal stretch to finish for the Indiana Hoosiers. I cannot wait. I know. To get I, into I this. I don't know. Saturday will be huge here in the Big Ten Network. An eight-game triple header. More than half of the conference plays here. Ohio State, Minnesota, Michigan State, Iowa, Michigan, Rutgers, Purdue, Indiana. All of them in action. Never too early to plan. Go to btn.com slash game finder for channel info in your area. And remember, all the games, as always, are on the Fox Sports app. And with that, we welcome in Joel Klatt, his first visit of the year. Of course, the lead game analyst for Fox Sports. Joel, great to have you back with us this year. 
Uh, let's start by looking back. I always like to do this with you. The biggest game of last weekend, obviously, was Ohio State beating Notre Dame. What did you learn about the Buckeyes in week one that might carry forward to the rest of this year? Yeah, I thought that they learned an important fact about their team, which is that they can win a game ugly and in a physical fashion, which is not something that I felt like they could do a year ago. Um, let's be honest, la last year in 2021, I thought Ohio State got pushed around a little bit, certainly schematically against Oregon, and Oregon did what they wanted to do. Michigan only had to throw, I think, four passes in the second half against Ohio State to beat them and just dominated them with their run game. And then Utah was, was physically dominating them at points in that Rose Bowl. And what Ohio State had to do last year was they had to go finesse and they had to go passing game. And it was C.J. Stroud and Jackson Smith and Jigba and, and, and the, you know, the Garrett Wilsons of the world and Chris Olave. And they just had to kind of outscore people. And I think to a degree, what you saw was a play caller in Ryan Day that acknowledged the fact of his team a year ago of what they were and so he threw it a lot you know near 60 percent of the time or a little over than that and then early against notre dame it was a similar style he thought okay i'm gonna lean on my strength i'm gonna lean on cj stroud in this passing game and what you saw in the second half was different rev this was a team that was physical and ran the ball when they had to especially in that fourth quarter when you get the ball inside your five yard line you're up, you need to run it. The opposition knows you need to run it. And they went seven minutes, 14 plays and scored a touchdown. That single drive that Ohio State had to basically finish out the game against Notre Dame, I think is going to do more for them later in the season than anything that could have happened during the course of that game. Granted, a loss would have been terrible, you know, but this style in which they won was better than winning 45-35 because it's like we we've seen that before right rev and and we kind of know what the ceiling is with that model of football so the way they won i, th I felt like was very important i'm with you 14 play drive you run the ball on 10 of those plays you end up almost equal in terms of number of runs and passes in the game 35 34 so really speaks to maybe a different uh, evolution of this ohio state offense you and Gus had a chance to see Penn State and Purdue, the Nittany Lions, speaking of defining drives, I mean, that Sean Clifford drive to go yeah. the length of the field after he'd thrown a bad interception that was brought back for a touchdown earlier. Did your perception of Penn State change in any way based on going into what was a hostile atmosphere against a good team and coming away with a win? No. Uh, it didn't it didn't change and it remains undecided uh, and the reason is is because I thought that they had very specific questions to answer coming into this season uh, first and foremost would they be able to run the football better and more effectively than they did a year ago uh, this is a team that averaged about 3.2 yards per carry last year I believe it was a hundred and I want to say 17th in the country wasn't good enough um, at all and I thought that their emphasis on that, their recruiting in that area with a guy like Nick Singleton coming in as the top running back in the country, facing a Purdue team that was 12th in the Big Ten stopping the run, I felt like we were going to see a much better running attack. And we didn't see it. They averaged less than 3.2 yards per carry. And granted, I understand that sacks uh, you know, bear into those numbers, but they were not dominant on the run. Uh, they weren't even better uh, in the run game. So a couple of things have to, ha have to happen. They've got to figure out what these young backs do best. For instance, I think that they would be better served, Rev, if they would back the backs up. We saw this with Master Teague and Trey Sermon with Ohio State a couple of years ago in which they said, you know, and acknowledged they weren't as good in the J.K. Dobbins style of running attack. So they put them back in the pistol and they let them get downhill. And I think the downhill runs are going to suit Nick Singleton much better than the side-to-side the -side shiftiness of what you would call kind of a side saddle back and the shotgun are. So that's one way they could potentially fix it moving forward. And then the other big question was just going to be on their defense. Could they replace not only Brent Pry, their defensive coordinator, but all those great all Big Ten selections that they had, including some of their leaders like Jaquan Brisker? And I think that remains to be seen. They made some plays late, but Purdue was able to move the football a little bit. So for me... Penn State's still kind of a standby. Um, they have much to prove moving forward.
Interesting, yeah, and we talked a lot. We have spoken a lot, Coach Leonardo and Howard and Joshua and I. I mean, the offensive line is is still remains a huge question mark. And, mm -hmm. and to your point, I mean, the longest run in that game was 12 yards. So yeah, it, it can be about the backs. It's about and the line. It, it just feels like it's an ongoing story. Well, and remember, you can help your line with scheme. Yeah. And 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 again, I I just never felt like they changed during the course of that game. Everything was side saddle, meaning the back was right next to the quarterback. Everything was a similar style of schematic. I think that they need to change that up a little bit. Maybe even allow the offensive lineman to roll off the ball and come off the ball and get downhill. I know that that seems like old school mentality, but it's worked for others in this conference just in recent vintage, like I explained with Ohio State. What do you make of the Michigan quarterback situation? I mean, there's incredible intrigue. We've got the game against Hawaii on Saturday. Yeah. You think mismatch, and yet everyone wants to watch it because they're fascinated by what happens with J.J. McCarthy. How do you think Jim Harbaugh is handling this? Well, he's in a tough spot. Yeah. And, and the reason being is, and, and this, is, this always sounds like a knock at Cade McNamara, but it's, it's not a knock. J.J.'s a more talented quarterback. Okay, I mean, that's that's just is what it is. Having said that, Cade McNamara has won 13 of his last 15 starts. He doesn't turn the ball over, um, and he's a quality leader. His teammates voted him captain. So Jim Harbaugh can't just say, like, hey, we got a better option. One, because Cade is still a very good option. He beat Ohio State, for goodness sakes. They hadn't done it in a decade. He won a Big Ten championship and went to a playoff. So th there is a nod, a tip of the cap to, listen, this guy deserves every chance to keep his job. Now, that being said, this has to be a true meritocracy. The best guy has to play because Jim Harbaugh owes it to his team and his coaching staff and the fan base more indirectly to play the best player. So the ability to, to, to start both of these guys, I think, has afforded them because of their schedule. And now what they're praying for is a Band-Aid style performance from J.J. McCarthy. And here's what I mean by a Band-Aid style performance. Rev, they are praying for an A or an F. Make it clear so we can move forward and actually name one of these guys a starting quarterback. They don't want him to go out there, throw for 285, maybe 300 yards, three touchdowns, and three interceptions or three turnovers. That's just going to continue this waffling throughout the year, very similar to what we had a year ago. They want A, they want F. How do you maximize your potential by minimizing your downside exposure? If he can minimize the mistakes, I think J.J. would have an opportunity to be the quarterback moving forward. Is there a Big Ten team other than the ones that we have discussed that maybe changed your perception of them the most here early on in the first week of the season? That's a good question. Um, changed my perception. Maybe Indiana. Everybody else kind of was what I, I, I expected uh, uh, to some degree. Um, and I would include Nebraska. I thought they would be much better and to lose the game the way they did against Northwestern now two weeks ago in Ireland um, with the same style of mistakes, it feels like Nebraska is, I tell you what, Nebraska is undefeated beating Nebraska. They beat themselves constantly. And that's a change of what I expected, those, those two programs. Uh, finally, I do want to ask you about college football playoff expansion, mm. your takeaway from the news from last week. Yeah, much needed, much needed. And, and you and I have talked about this now for a yep. couple of years. Um, and I think that the data bears it out. And it's important that we acknowledge the data. There's only been 13 teams play in the college football playoff, Rev. That's, that's too few. That's only, a, I think, 10% of college football. Uh, if we would have had this 12-team model in place over the last eight years during the playoff era, we would have had 41 teams total. That's wow. 28 additional teams. Well, that's a third of college football. Uh, which is much better for the sport. Why? Because then you can define yourself as successful. And for instance, Penn State would have been to four playoffs in the last eight years. Uh, Wisconsin, three playoffs. Michigan State, uh, an, another playoff. Michigan, 
multiple playoffs. Ohio State, every single playoff, eight of them. Only team in the country that could say that they would have been in every single playoff would have been Ohio State. And what that would have done, Rev, is it would have allowed these teams to go and recruit at a much higher level and start to disperse what has been the concentration of five-star talent into, into too few areas. For example, If you look at five-star recruits since 2014, Alabama has gotten 40 of them, and the sixth-place team on that list is Texas A&M. I believe it's 18 or 19. Well, that's a huge disparity. And by the way, the top five schools on the five-star list, guess who they are? The five schools that won national championships. It's Alabama 40, Georgia 36, uh, Ohio State 26, Clemson 22, and LSU 20, I believe it is. So the, d- the dispersion of some of that talent is important, and I think this playoff and its expansion is a way to do that. Well, you and I both think that uh, it, it should be great. And again, it gives everyone hope, too, going into the year. And, and I think that kind of furthers your point that not only would more teams have been in it, but there are even more that believe they could That's be right. in it. So it, it, and, it's going to be And great. by the way, and I know we're, we're running – it's, it's important for those conferences that aren't the Big Ten and the SEC yes. to stay together because now they have a legitimate path to the playoff. No, if you're a Pac-12 team, now you can be like, well, now we can stay in this conference and, and we still have a chance. You have to have everyone in the country participating in this sport and believing that they are a part of competing for its national championship, 100%. Yeah. Joel Klatt, looking forward to every Thursday visiting with you. Thanks so much for giving us your time as you do each and every year. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Good to see you, bud.